Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. Today's lecture by Dr. David Fenio will talk about predictive analysis. He will provide a detailed information in supervised machine learning how it is linked with predictive analysis. Dr. Fenio will briefly discuss various parameters which are important for how to train a model, how to test a predictive model. He will also talk to us about how predictive analysis can be used in treatment of cancer, especially in taking decision of treatment strategies. Dr. Fenio will also talk about image classification and how the image classification could be used for skin cancer diagnosis. So, let us welcome Dr. David Fenio for today's lecture. Now, we are going to talk about um, machine learning and specifically about uh, predictive analysis. So, um, and what that's, so you heard Mani's lecture where he talked about unsupervised and supervised machine learning. So, what we are going to talk about today is purely uh, supervised. Um, so, uh, that means that you need um, a set of uh, uh, labeled data. So, I mean, Mane gave a very uh, uh, short introduction and I will uh, plan to go a little bit uh, deeper and give you um, more uh, details about this. So, uh, the, what I would like to, to uh, learn this morning is, first of all, how does one uh, train a model? Um, and there we're going to talk about uh, gradient descent which is a way to uh, a method, a quite general method to, to find the parameters of the model. Then uh, we're going to talk about regularization, uh, which is a, a method to, to protect us from uh, overfitting. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about all these terms uh, in detail. The other thing we talk, we'll talk about is feature selection. So, uh, one thing that in proteogenomics is that we measure a lot of things. Uh, we measure, uh, 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 let's say, uh, tens of thousands of transcripts, maybe uh, 10,000 proteins, uh, maybe uh, 30,000 phosphorylation sites. So, it's a, a lot of measurements on different uh, molecules. Um, but most of these will not be uh, relevant to, uh, to uh, let's say, uh, predicting uh, uh, what happens to, uh, to a tumor. Um, and the, uh, so, what, uh, what we want to do is focusing in on the, the important ones. And that's what, uh, why we do uh, feature selection. So, we select out uh, the, the genes that are uh, important to uh, and, uh, and closely related to what we want to predict. Um, so, uh, uh, then we'll just briefly touch upon that, but people have developed a lot of different uh, methods to machine learning and a lot of different approaches uh, on how to do this. And so, we'll talk a little bit about how to uh, choose the right uh, uh, method for the uh, for the problem that uh, you want to solve, so that's um, that's another thing that's um, uh, uh, quite uh, important. Then, the uh, a very important thing is that then after we've trained our model, we need to test it. We need to evaluate how good it is and how well it uh, um, generalizes. So that's and there we're going to talk about overfitting and underfitting. Um, so, um, I showed this slide in, uh, two days ago, and so this is one uh, example of predictive modeling. So, when uh, this, uh, for example, the surgeon uh, cuts out the primary tumor, um, we can, we analyze the primary tumor, uh, let's say measure, uh, we do RNA-seq and uh, proteomics, and then we want to, from that measurement, uh, build a predictive model that can tell the oncologist uh, which combination of drugs to give 
um, to um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, cure the cancer, and this uh, and this will of course depend on the both the individual and the uh, type of tumor uh, that they have. So this just shows in one example uh, in top the treatment A is what we want. And, but for the, the individual uh, in the lower panel, we want, uh, the treatment B works much better. And uh, this, uh, and because currently, as you probably know very well, that's not the case. I mean, there is some standard of care that's given to everyone, and it's only in a few uh, specific cases where we can uh, make these decisions. But of course, the hope is that uh, by uh, uh, doing research in proteogenomics, in the, in the future, we will uh, be able to make these kinds of decisions uh, uh, in a more uh, general way. So, uh, you probably read in the newspapers that machine learning uh, has improved a lot. So, people have been working on machine learning for uh, several decades, but the last uh, uh, few years, it's really exploded, and things work much better than it has in the past. So one thing that has been, for example, very successful is image classification. So uh, uh, the, like Google and Facebook, they have a lot of images, so they, have, uh, they put uh, large efforts into automatically uh, annotating these images and classifying them. And uh, it's uh, actually amazing how well uh, it works. Uh, so, and as you see, these are just, uh, this is one big uh, data set that's often used for this training. It's a very, very large variety uh, of uh, uh, images, but also how easy it is to see what's in the images. So that's, but uh, this has really become, um, uh, so for several years they had competitions on who could develop the best algorithm to look at these uh, images, but uh, um, now they've actually given up on uh, image classification competitions because it works too well. There's not worth uh, doing much more. Uh, so they uh, look at more complicated problems. But this is the general, and of course this we can apply in our field. And uh, uh, for example, so there was a Nature uh, publication uh, last year on the uh, skin cancer diagnosis. So what uh, uh, the authors did was they um, had uh, cell phone images uh, of um, uh, uh, moles on people's skin. Um, and then uh, they built, uh, had pathologists, I mean, uh, uh, dermatologists look at these images and classify them if they were benign or um, they were uh, uh, cancerous. And then they built uh, so they, and they collected a lot of images. So it was, um, I think, close to 130,000. Um, and then built a model with that, and then they could show that uh, it actually, their uh, machine learning model worked better than uh, at least average pathologist. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, and that's quite incredible. I mean, you can imagine the implications if you can just uh, you're worried about some mole and you take a, a picture of it on your cell phone and upload it uh, to uh, some web service and then you get an answer back right away uh, what, with high accuracy. So another thing that has been very successful is uh, teaching uh, algorithms to play games. So uh, uh, quite a while ago, um, chess uh, uh, games, uh, machines were, became very good at playing chess and then uh, for, and became better than any human. But still for a while there, if you had a collaboration between an algorithm and a person, um, that was better than any algorithm on its own. But that's not the case anymore. Now uh, the human doesn't add anything extra in chess. Um, so, uh, and then more complicated games like Go has also become a uh, uh, jeopardy. Um, the, the advantage in games, which we don't have uh, in our case, is that uh, if you can have different, slightly different algorithms uh, play against each other, 
you can in general uh, you can generate as much training data uh, as you want because in our case we have a certain number of tumors that we analyze and if we analyze more tumors that's more expensive so that's uh, limited but in the game case it's only uh, if you have uh, large computers you can have the algorithms play against each other and learn from uh, uh, from these uh, playing so it's in principle um, generating uh, any uh, uh, any amount of training data so that's something that people are trying to do in uh, proteogenomics genomics also but it's it's dangerous because there we have to then uh, if we want to generate more data uh, we have to model our data we have to build some kind of model uh, how our data behaves and uh, so so that of course um, then the algorithm will probably mainly learn what we think the data looks like and not really uh, not anything real uh, another example that uh, from the general thing is uh, uh, language translation so this was an uh, some, uh, in the New York Times uh, two years ago uh, so this is a passage from um, Hemingway's snows of Kilimanjaro um, and uh, so the, fir uh, the one of them is the Hemingway's original uh, the other one is was a Japanese translation by a person uh, by uh, 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 an author uh, from English to Japanese and then taking the Japanese uh, um, uh, uh, translation and translating it back using uh, Google Translator so which is which yeah yeah so it's mainly the uh, dead body of leopard that's the main and then there are maybe some other nuanced things but there's only one small grammatical error so it's I mean this is quite uh, amazing so um, I'm just showing these general examples because uh, uh, as an inspiration that we should do the same for uh, proteogenomics uh, to be able to do uh, these kinds of things uh, but of course as I said before um, uh, the, the advantage in all of these cases uh, both with the image analysis uh, translation and um, uh, with games is that there is a very large uh, uh, data set that's been uh, labeled so that's uh, that's really what we uh, what we need and unfortunately our data sets are usually uh, limited and uh, not uh, and we would always uh, want them to be larger to be able to achieve um, um, uh, things like this so uh, uh, let's look a little bit more at uh, the details of supervised learning so um, as Mani already mentioned we have two main things one is regression other one is classification um, and uh, so, so what uh, supervised learning is is we uh, we build a very we have a very general model with lots of parameters. Um, we into this model there uh, there is no biological knowledge. It's just a very generic, and we're going to look a little bit at what uh, what is. So, it's just a generic model that can um, pretty much approximate any type of function and then we want to learn uh, the parameters that uh, are um, uh, that best fit that so uh, we're going to look first at regression and uh, then what regression is is that we have uh, some variables that we measure we call them x usually so in this case uh, for illustration purposes we, uh, we only show one uh, uh, x-axis and then uh, we want to predict what uh, uh, the value y is so uh, x would be for example the level of uh, a, a transcript that we measure with RNA-seq or uh, the, the level of a phosphorylation site that we measure with mass spectrometry but with all data we have um, actually many measurements so uh, even though I only show one measurement you should always imagine that there are uh, 10,000 uh, axes or uh, 100,000 axes 
it's very difficult to imagine uh, what that happens and also it uh, uh, methods that work on on low dimensions become it uh, things behave very different when you go to high dimensions so so what regression is is that uh, we pretty much try to in this case when we have one x and one y we try to find the function that uh, describes the relationship. It's quite uh, uh, straightforward that way. Um, and in uh, classification, we try to find the boundary um, between uh, two classes. And so in this case, uh, the, uh, there are two measurements. So x1 would be, uh, let's say, the level of one protein, x2 the level of uh, another protein. And then we have, for example, the, the yellow circles um, uh, could be uh, uh, that uh, patients that have uh, long survival and the black ones, the uh, pa patients that have short survival. And we want to find uh, the boundary so we can classify uh, when we've done the measurements, uh, will this, we can answer the question, will this patient survive for a short or a long time? And uh, if we go back to the regression case, there we would, um, the Y could be uh, instead, uh, how many months will this patient survive? So uh, we're going to start with uh, linear regression. And uh, so here, the axes, so we can have many uh, axes, those are uh, different uh, uh, measurements that we do, uh, quantitative measurement. And then for each of them, we have a different weight. Um, and so what the uh, output the y is, is we take each measurement and multiply its weight and uh, uh, sum that up and add a constant. Um, and then, so that's, you recognize that um, if we uh, have just one x as uh, the linear regression uh, case. Um, so now one thing to point out that uh, we can also have an orbit, uh, uh, arbitrary function of x. We don't just need, we can, we don't have to limit ourselves to just using x, but we can, for example, uh, uh, have uh, a polynomial um, as a, uh, that has an input uh, as x. Uh, it's still linear regression because it's, uh, what linear regression, it's linear in the, um, uh, in the w, in the parameters that we are learning. So, um, so one thing is that we have limited data. We can build these models arbitrarily complex. Um, so uh, what we, uh, we can, uh, but we have to choose how complex to make them. So uh, in this case, if we have these da uh, data points, um, it could be pretty reasonable to draw, uh, just have a linear regression. Um, a very, not a very uh, complex function, uh, and uh, that would, uh, could work well. Um, but one could also have a much more complex function, and then we would have the, the lower case. Can you please give an example of uh, uh, some sort of data for the regression? Yeah, so maybe the, the output could be uh, we want to predict uh, how many months a person will uh, uh, survive. And then we, uh, the input would be uh, the pro, uh, several different proteins, the levels of them, and then we can use that as uh, uh, the, uh, 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 to predict. Uh, and then what we want to learn are the weights. So the analysis is the right will get us for how long that person will survive. Yes. So what, are, uh, what, so what will be x1, x2, x3 and so on? Oh, so x1, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, x1 would be one protein, x2 would be another protein <laughs> and so on. So we would, uh, and then we're going to talk about some, let's say we measure the levels of 10,000 proteins, uh, but um, uh, we, that's uh, a lot of parameters. So we can, uh, we probably don't have enough, um, uh, enough samples to uh, support such a complex model. So we're going to talk about how to select which proteins are uh, important a little bit later. So we have these two cases. So um, 
which one is right, correct? Who wants to, please, who, who thinks the top one is correct? Please raise your hands. The answer is that there's no way to tell. Because uh, if you only have your training data, there's no way to tell. I mean, yes, I agree. The top one is more likely. That's what we more would guess. But it's just a guess. It's really, we don't know. Um, we need to collect more data. And so we need to always train on one data set and then uh, test our model on an independent data set. So let's say that we measure more data. And these are now, so the black ones are the same as before. So we have the gray ones, these are uh, new independent test set. That will be, now we can say that we, we trust uh, the, the, uh, the linear regression. But for example, if for some reason this would happen when we do our, uh, 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 then we would uh, choose the more complex model. Uh, but uh, the, the main thing is that uh, the, it's really, uh, when you only have your training data set, there's no way to tell how good it is. And, uh, uh, and so that, that's probably the most important uh, thing from my lecture here today. Um, and another way to show this is here. Now we've uh, on the, uh, this is the same uh, data set that uh, we, uh, those 12 points, I think it was. Um, if we, uh, and we see that when we increase the degree of the polynomials, so we increase the complexity, uh, we can make the error go down, uh, in this case, to zero when we have uh, the same degree uh, polynomial as we have number of uh, data points. Uh, so, um, uh, so this is, so one thing about the error um, that I'm, and you're probably familiar with this, that uh, we have to, of course, uh, both for training and for testing, choose uh, a, a function that uh, we uh, in training minimize and then uh, we in testing we, we use to evaluate. And for, for linear regression, anyone uh, remembers what we use as the, this uh, uh, loss function? It's the sum, you, uh, you take the, for each data point the distance to uh, the, the line and then you square uh, the error and then you take the sum of the square of the errors. You remember that from high school maybe? No. No, no, sum of square errors. Not, uh, I mean, usually not, I mean, you can take the average, it doesn't matter, but uh, um, you can uh, just, uh, it's really usually just the sum of the, uh, you take each error for each data point and then uh, you sum them. It's very, it's simpler than that. Uh, it's just taking each error, taking the square, and then adding them up. That's the most common uh, way. It's, that's the, uh, uh, the SD. Uh, so square deviation. Uh, yeah, you can do the mean, but you don't even have to do the mean. Just the square deviation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the sum of the square, yeah. You have to sum them, but you don't have to take the mean, yeah. So it's very simple, and you all, you all know this, uh, I'm sure. Um, so, oh yeah, so going back to here. So we know that in a training set, if we make our uh, function complex, uh, we can minimize, have the error go down to zero. But of course, this is meaningless because we just have uh, made an overly complex uh, uh, fit to all the uh, uh, sort of noise that's in our uh, training data. Um, so uh, because of this, a long time ago, uh, Johnny von Neumann said that if you give him four parameters, he can fit an elephant to any data. Um, and with five, uh, he can wiggle uh, his trunk. So, uh, meaning, so what he meant was just this, that if you uh, uh, train on, uh, um, 
if you evaluate your model with your training data, that's not uh, meaningful. And of course, uh, this was a long time ago, so he had much uh, uh, less uh, data. So uh, he was worried about four parameters. Nowadays, when people build deep learning models, they have hundreds of thousands of parameters and uh, worry much less than uh, Johnny von Neumann. Today you learned how supervised machine learning and regression and classification plays a role in predictive analysis. Dr. Fenu also showed how predictive analysis could help in skin cancer diagnosis and found to be superior when compared to pathology based diagnosis. We also learned that how overfitting or underfitting plays an important role in model capacity. Finally, we understood that the capacity of a model describes how complex a relationship it can model. You could expect a model with higher capacity to be able to model more relationships between more variables than a model with a lower capacity. In the next lecture, Dr. David Fenio will talk more about predictive analysis, giving more emphasis on training a model and testing a model. Thank you.